Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, Leo for inviting me and for rescheduling the whole meeting for me. Uh, uh, it was my fault that I was not on time. Um, back to uh, severe asthma, um, and uh, Leo asked me to um, have a talk about uh, look beyond the lungs. And while I was preparing this talk, I realized that in fact severe asthma and even the, the subtypes of severe asthma, they are all in fact uh, systemic diseases. And at least the interaction between the lungs and the rest of the body is, uh, is, is remarkable and I will show you uh, in what respect. So first, um, the um, interaction between the lungs and the rest of the body is important because um, clinically there may be um, signs and comorbidities that are very typical for a certain type of severe asthma and it's important for the clinician to recognize these comorbidities and signs to be able to do the right diagnostics and give the right treatment to the patients. And secondly, there are lots of um, comorbidities and factors, hormonal factors, that influence the severity of asthma and that can augment the, uh, the symptoms. And finally, the drug that is mostly used in uh, severe asthma, prednisone, has of course many, many systemic side effects which are very important in, in the clinic. So I will start with this, this landmark study. You probably have seen it already today. Uh, this is uh, from the group of uh, Ian Pavert and Chris Breitling. Uh, they did a cluster analysis on, um, on a large group of patients with asthma, the blue ones in secondary care, the more severe ones, and the yellow uh, clusters are more the milder ones. And I would like to focus on three common phenotypes here, the severe atopic patients with asthma. Here, the severe eosinophilic patients with late onset asthma. And finally, here, the severe patients uh, who are female and are obese. So let's start with uh, the severe atopic asthma patients. Atopy is apparently not a lung disease only. It starts already in a childhood where you have gastrointestinal uh, symptoms like food allergy, cow milk allergy. Uh, then you have atopic dermatitis, you have allergic rhinitis, conjunctivitis. So all uh, manifestations of allergy that are not uh, only in the lungs. And this type of patient with severe asthma, they, apart from this atopy, they all also can suffer from uh, comorbidities and, and factors that make asthma worse. And I would like, f for now, only concentrate on the brain, on the GE tract, and uh, um, gastrointestinal tract, and the vascular system. So first, the brain. Many, many years ago, we already showed in our group that patients with severe asthma, um, they have, um, uh, so if they, if they have also uh, psychopathology, meaning um, anxiety and depression mainly, then they are much less controlled than equally severe patients without psychopathology. They go more often to the GP, more emergency visits, more exacerbations, more hospital admissions, and even more mechanical ventilations. So apparently there is an interaction between the brain and asthma symptoms. And a very interesting uh, study by Rosenkranz published last year in the PLOS one, showed that if you um, give emotional stress to patients, and in the meantime that you do that, there is a uh, activation of the insula, then these patients have more eosinophilic inflammation during the late response after allergen challenge. So suggesting that there is a direct relationship between emotional stress and eosinophilic inflammation in the lungs, which I think is a very important finding. 
So the next question then is, is treating emotional stress then beneficial for asthma symptoms? And here in this paper from uh, Peber in Thorax last year, uh, they showed that if you give an eight-week program of mindfulness, that then you have a long-lasting improvement in asthma-related quality of life. And this is not the case if you give just a, um, a, a, an educational program. So uh, there was also a trend for better asthma control, but uh, unfortunately no effect on, uh, on lung function. So the second factor that is uh, um, uh, yeah, often influencing asthma control in uh, patients with severe asthma is uh, gastroesophageal reflux. Uh, more than 70% of patients have that. But unfortunately, if you treat uh, the reflux with proton pump inhibitors, you s don't see an improvement in most uh, studies. And that doesn't exclude that maybe the non-acid reflux can have a role, but that has never been investigated yet. An underestimated uh, cause of loss of control in severe asthma is an increased uh, coagulation activity. And this not only has a risk for pulmonary embolism, uh, as we showed in a paper in the uh, European Respiratory Journal, there is an almost tenfold increased risk of pulmonary embolism in patients with severe asthma, but also the increased coagulation activity uh, via the degradation products of fibrin and activation of toll-like 4 receptors can augment eosinophilic inflammation. So there is increased coagulation activity in asthma that influences the, um, the symptoms. The second important phenotype that we all recognize in the clinic is the patient who has eosinophilic asthma despite optimal treatment and um, has an asthma that starts later in life. And a typical characteristic for this patient is that they have severe chronic rhinosinusitis and nasal polyposis. And uh, often these patients also have aspirin sensitivity, um, asthma that starts later in life and is eosinophilic. And here uh, Marijke Amelink uh, in our group shows that indeed if you compare patients with late onset who have severe disease with those who have mild disease, those with severe disease are the ones with the nasal polyps and the absence of allergy, it is a non-atopic eosinophilia, and a lot of eosinophils in the sputum. Now, eosinophils in the sputum are difficult to assess. That is a criticism. But fortunately, we now showed that if you have different markers in, uh, for example, periostin or exhaled NO uh, and eosinophils in blood, that the eosinophils in blood are very accurate to, um, to predict eosinophilia in the lungs, so you can use that as a surrogate. However, um, did I, well, I, I'll come to that later. Um, so the question is, of course, do these, do, does this um, polyps or eosinophilia, are they just epiphenomena of a certain phenotype or do they really influence the severity of asthma? Now, this is a study, not a very beautiful study, but showing that if you treat polyps surgically or medically, then if you do surgery, there is not much improvement of PEF or FEV1 or NO. But if you then treat them medically with corticosteroids, then you see a significant improvement in uh, in these asthma parameters uh, in patients who have polyposis. So suggesting that treating polyps can influence inflammation or disease of the lungs. So that's worth doing. Um, another study, uh, when we tackle the eosinophils, and this time with high dose of trium intramuscularly, 
in patients who have eosinophilia and you give it, then all the eosinophils are reduced to almost zero. And in the meantime, placebo or treatment, there is an improvement in FEV1 after two weeks. So suggesting that if you abolish the eosinophils with high dose uh, corticosteroids in patients who already have corticosteroids, then you can still get an improvement. So eosinophilia probably um, it contributes to the severity of the disease. I'll come to that later as well. Then the third uh, phenotype, <coughs> the patients who are obese and mostly female, uh, what, is, what is the characteristic of these patients? Well, it's obvious, they have a high BMI, high waist circumference, and very interestingly, for those who are, are pulmonologists amongst you, they breathe at a very low lung volume, and already at rest, they have they are limited in their expiratory flow. When they do an exercise, they really get an attack without any inflammation. It's just a mechanical factor. That is typical for this phenotype. There is no eosinophilia normally in the sputum. And that's to say the higher the BMI is, the less likely there are, sputum, uh, there are eosinophils in the sputum. So eosinophilic inflammation is apparently not a problem. Uh, however, a very recent study by Desai uh, in uh, Chris Breitling's group showed that if you look in the submucosa of these ob obese patients, that you can find eosinophilia, although in the sputum eosinophils are absent. And this also is related, to my opinion, with eosinophilia in blood. So absence of eosinophils in sputum does not mean that eosinophils do not play a role. So in adipose tissue, there are several factors that can uh, make asthma even more severe. That is um, obstructive sleep apnea in the hypopharynx. That is uh, the adipose tissue itself and hormones, uh, sex hormones. Um, about obstructive sleep apnea, this sh study shows that patients who have this disorder uh, have an increased unadjusted and adjusted odds of having higher, so more asthma symptoms. So there is a relationship between sleep apnea and uncontrolled asthma. Question is, does it help to give these patients continuous uh, positive airway pressure, CPAP therapy? Well, there are not many studies, but this is one showing that if you uh, give patients with severe asthma this treatment, that you get an improvement in asthma-related quality of life, but not an improvement in asthma control, not an improvement in FEV1. So a little bit disappointing, but uh, you, you, you could try this treatment in these patients. How about the influence of the fat tissue itself? Well, visceral fat is able to produce uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, like IL-6, uh, and also all kinds of hormones, like adipokines, uh, leptin is one of them. And this study by Sidaliva shows that the higher the expression of leptin in the fat tissue, so the more adipose tissue there is and the more of leptin expression, the more hyper-responsive the patients are. So there is a relationship between adipose tissue and hyper-responsiveness. Uh, last, why is it always in females that a severe asthma occurs? Well, this has to do something with hormones that can't be uh, anything else. But it is a very complex interaction. Um, it is an, an interaction on the level of the smooth muscle itself, but also inflammation in the airways and immune responses in the airways, so it's not very clear. Here you can see that, uh, starting here, that females who have asthma have large swings in asthma symptoms, like wheeze, uh, as compared to uh, 
uh, females who don't have asthma, suggesting that these hormones uh, have a role. And if you look then, what is happening here around the ovulation, high estrogen levels and relatively low symptoms, might suggest that estrogens are good for you, but unfortunately all the trials, and this is one of them, show that if you give estrogens to pre, uh, perimenopausal women, that uh, you have increased asthma symptoms instead of uh, uh, less asthma symptoms. So that is not a solution to the answer. So a hormonal replacement therapy uh, is not helpful. The only thing that really can help is significant weight reduction. This is a very uh, recent paper in the European Respiratory Journal showing that people who underwent a weight reduction program with low calorie intake and several medications, that only those who are able to reduce their weight with more than 10% had a better asthma control score. Uh, if you were not able to uh, reach the 10%, it did not help very much. So uh, that is about the phenotypes, the comorbidities, and the significant factors. Now, a few words about prednisone. These patients with severe asthma, they use a lot of prednisone, sometimes in courses, sometimes chronically. And the uh, side effects of prednisone are known to you all. They can be very severe, especially hypertension, diabetes, osteoporosis, and uh, of course, um, uh, cardiovascular uh, events. And these patients have to be monitored for that uh, if you treat them, and uh, they all have to have osteoporosis prevention. Fair, so the side effects of prednisone affect also the whole uh, human system. The only way to avoid these uh, prednisone side effects is of course give targeted new uh, personalized treatments and there are a few now that uh, are promising. Uh, this is uh, anti-IgE that can reduce the amount of exacerbation, so the um, amount of prednisone that you have to give to the patients. Also, anti and, and of course, um, I, can't, I can't go back, but um, anti-IgE uh, is for the allergic severe asthma phenotype. Anti-IL-5 is most probably better suited for the non-atopic eosinophilic phenotype. Also reduces exacerbations, but more importantly, it... Um, uh, it also can uh, be helpful for the other systemic effects of the disease like nasal polyposis and has a significant prednisone reduction um, uh, capability. And a completely different uh, approach is more holistic, uh, send your patients to the mountains. Uh, we did a study, this is just one small result, it reduces uh, asthma symptoms dramatically, but also reduces the need for prednisone. What the reason for it is, we don't know, maybe the clean air or maybe the exercise or maybe the absence of any uh, trigger factors. But it is the only thing that some patients can benefit of. So in summary, um, severe asthma, yes. Look beyond the lungs. Not only for comorbidities and typical signs, but also for the side effects of a medication. Uh, so, in my opinion, the three phenotypes of severe asthma I discussed have all the aspects of a systemic disorder, both the uh, allergic onset, atopic, late onset, non-atopic, or obese female phenotypes. So, if you treat these patients, Treating the lungs alone is not enough. I think all these patients need a systemic uh, treatment. And uh, the mechanisms of the interactions are not completely clear yet. Um, therefore, I think uh, we need more research to find novel treatments. 
um, and maybe systems medicines uh, will help us to find the key uh, targets. Thank you very much.